Welcome to my first video that's delving into the world of marine conservation. I'm going to be covering a few topics that are just pretty relevant when it comes to what you guys might be teaching at your future conservation centres. Um, some of the other instructors are going to be doing these ones as well, um, but let's jump straight into it. Today, I am going to be telling you guys about some corals that being what we probably deem to be the five most important corals of the Indo-Pacific that we would recommend you guys getting your head around because you are really likely going to have to teach these yourselves to your students. So I'm going to share my screen. We're going to have a little bit of a presentation style thing going. I'm going to remain up in the top corner. So keep an eye on me and all of my hand movements if you want to. But mostly you can just watch the slides. So, Top five, in our opinions. We've done a fair bit of diving around the Indo-Pacific ourselves, and we're going with the ones that we definitely deem to probably be the most frequently occurring. But of course, it's gonna be a bit of variation uh, depending on where we are. Obviously, if you are in a location where these corals aren't relevant, although I doubt that at least some of these are, or some of these are definitely gonna be relevant to you, um, you might have to sort of shift uh, around and choose some of your own genera. Today we are going to be sticking to genera as opposed to species um, and that is because when it comes to making in-field, on-site decisions and observations, describing species to a genus level is much more realistic. When it comes to IDing to a species level, it can be really quite tricky to do with the naked eye. You might need a genetic sample, you might need a microscope and when it comes to us doing say our EMP surveys on a week-to-week -week or day-to-day -day basis, we need a be able to collect data to a point that's, you know, realistic. Secondly, we're obviously going to be focusing on hard corals, or maybe not obviously, but we are going to be focusing on hard corals today. And that's because they are reef building corals. So this is important to coral reef ecosystems because coral reefs are dependent on having hard substrate available to the animals and organisms that live there. So hard corals themselves cannot just recruit onto soft substrates such as silt or sand. They need something hard to recruit onto, whether that be a dead coral or a rock or rubble, anything like this. Um, this applies to other animals such as your soft corals, your gorgonians, your zoanthids, your corallomorphs and so many other organisms too. So hard corals are producing more eventual substrate as they're growing. So they're really, really important to monitor because they just have this overarching impact on the future of coral reef ecosystems, you know, even after they die. But also, of course, when they're alive, they provide habitat, um, they provide food sources and so much more to reef organisms. So let's jump into it. Acropora being number one. There are a lot of species of Acropora and we are just focusing on the Indo-Pacific today, by the way. Um, this is from the Acroporidae family. Our next coral is also going to be from this family. Acroporas are very distinct because they have got an axial polyp at the tip of each of their branches. So I'm going to put on my little cursor over here and you guys are going to be able to see what I'm pointing to. These guys there. It's always going to be at the tips of each of their branches. And if you say you're in the field and you notice a branch of Acropora and there's a random axial polyp from the side of a branch and you think that's got to be wrong because there's no branch there, what that means is realistically the, the coral is going to begin growing a branch there. They always lead those branches unless there's been a, a natural fragmentation process or something like that occurring. So these guys are very fast growing. Our restoration programs globally, especially in places like the Caribbean, Florida Keys, they often do work with Acropora. It is a highly vulnerable uh, genus as well, especially the Palmata and Cervicornis species. But we can dig into those another day a little bit deeper. So generally speaking, yes, they grow fast up to 10 centimetres per year. The growth forms in which these corals grow is generally branching, corombos being that very bushy, dense branching, digitate and tabulate, so the table corals too. They're really ecologically important. They provide a lot of habitat for small fishes and they are also providing nursery grounds. So let's just look at another close-up shot here. So you can really see that that axial polyp 
is a lot larger and more protruding than the radial polyps, which are the other polyps that make up Acropora corals. Um, radial means surrounding and Acropora, uh, not Acropora, axial polyps means I'm quite sure like the tip of or like a protruding area. Um, so it's quite descriptive. And as you guys can see from this photo, it's quite close up. You can actually see the tentacles extending from each of these radial polyps too. Acroporidae still, the second coral is Montipora. So this is a really beautiful coral, often creates a lot of like really beautiful, delicate plating. Um, it has very small polyps, just a couple of millimetres in length that are grouped between skeletal structures or bumps called monticules. There are a few different ways to describe skeletal bumps on corals, but for Montipora, it's appropriately named monticules. It sort of nearly goes hand in hand. Um, so these ones grow as encrusting, laminar, submassive, and sometimes even branching. Um, some people find them easy to confuse with parietes, which is another coral we're about to be uh, covering in this slideshow, but parietes lack monticules. So with these guys here, you really are looking for these sorts of bumps protruding from the skeleton and the polyps are going to be nested between them and you often can see the tentacles actually sticking out there as well. And these guys have got six tentacles if you want to get that close and check it out yourself. Let's look at another couple of examples. Here's one just of the beautiful branching, uh, sorry, plating nature of these corals. And here you can also just see the extent of some of those monticules and all the polyps nestled between. I'm quite sure that this is a Montipora varicosa. Varicosa meaning warts, bumps in Latin. <laughs> so then we've got Pavona. We've got about 19 species and we're swapping families now. We're in the Agarucidae family. I was about to say something else then. <laughs> so these guys have got a Themnasteroid colony formation. Themnasteroid meaning that there is no clearly defined walls on the edge of these corallites. So the scepter just flow freely from polyp to polyp and you haven't got any borders there essentially. The plates of these guys, and they do generally grow as encrusting folios, that sort of being these plates that we're seeing on the screen here, as well as submassive Pavona explanulata, for example. So what's interesting with these guys is that they can differ in their orientation, meaning they can grow more upward or they can grow more horizontally, depending on where they're located in the water column. So say a coral or a pavona coral is located in the shallows, we often find that the plates are growing quite vertically, just in these photos here, just like in these photos here. Um, and this is essentially because they've they're good, they're shallow, not much sunlight is being lost in the depth of that water there. And so they don't need to try and maximize on their sun exposure. They've already got enough. Whereas if you were to pop them a little bit deeper in the water column, where there's less sunlight actually protruding through there, they might start growing a little bit more horizontally or entirely so nearly to maximize the amount of exposure they have to the sun. They're essentially gonna be like, swapping the direction of their solar panels so they can max out on that sunshine, um, which is very, very cool. They're also bifacial, which means that they've got polyps on both sides of these plates that we can see here. Now let's also see a close-up. So you can really see that there is no nicely defined walls, but they have got this beautiful flow on with the scepter here, which is really, really lovely. They're kind of like lots of little flowers, you could say. So next, we've also got Lobophilia, which I think is a very easy name to remember because it is a very lobe-like coral. A lot of people will just describe them as the brain corals. And, you know, our brains have got lobes in them. So the name association there is, is really quite an easy one. This genus has got 20 species and it's from the Lobophilidae family. We have these very large flavolate coralites and they break into cones that can reach the center of the colony often. The tissue is very thick. Okay, not that we should ever go touch them for no reason, but you can sort of see it if you get close enough. And they do have very spiky septal teeth, but this is something you wouldn't notice unless the colony had died, because of course it's gonna be covered in that thick tissue. These guys always grow as massive. So these really nice big bouldering colonies that we can see right here in front of us. And let's go ahead and look at some of those actual polyp mouths. So as you can see, they're quite large. There's no scale here, but one of these mouths might be the size of my little fingernail there, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, sometimes it's gonna be one mouth sort of per lobe segment, and sometimes you're gonna get a couple like in this individual there. 
Now we've got Pruritis. So this is from the Pruritidae family. Um, we've got around 68 species within this genus and generally speaking, they're very smooth colonies. There are a couple of examples, like the Parides negrosensis, which is a little bit more bumpy in between. This is probably where some people get them a little bit mixed up with your Montipora. But while there are bumps in the between these coralites there, they're not really protruding to any sort of significant extent. Um, I sort of think these look like a little bit like popcorn. I call them like the popcorn varieties. I'm not sure. Um, but the coralites are small again, so one to two millimetres in width. They grow as submassive, sub sub just like in this photo right here. But we also have them as branching, like in our smaller example. If they're stressed, they sometimes produce a fluorescent pigment that is often pink or purple. It's not saying that only priorities do this, other corals do do this as well under stress. Um, and this can be to maximize or to minimize sun exposure, essentially. It's sort of like a natural sunscreen you can describe it as. Um, I think priorities is sort of just like thinking of a very porous colony with lots of little pores all over its skin, just like we have lots of little pores all over our skin. And let's just look at something very, very impressive to wrap up our fifth coral. So this is just a photo I took when I was diving in the Maldives and that was just so utterly impressed by the sheer size of this Parides growth here. I think it was the size of a small house or so. Anyway, that concludes our first five corals that we're going to be covering. We very likely may do a few more. We'll certainly do this for the Caribbean as well. Um, but I hope this was useful to you. Remember to keep in mind that it's okay if you don't remember these all in the first turn, but use whatever learning techniques work for you to get them in your head because understanding the diversity of hard reef building corals is really essential, okay? Understanding diversity as opposed to just understanding that coral is there is really, really good for, uh, for your long-term monitoring. Uh, thanks guys, and um, I'll see you next week.